What's going on, everybody? Zach Rosenblatt back again with Mike K for another free agency no huddle show. Uh, the Eagles made a move that I didn't entirely expect to happen, but I think we both will agree on how we feel about that move. But anyway, the you know a few things have happened. A few more things probably will happen. The Eagles have still been silent on the wide receiver market. Um, the player that, that I was referring to, they signed Nikel Roby Coleman, the a nickel cornerback from the Los Angeles Rams. They signed him to a relatively cheap deal. We can get into that in a bit. He's most famous for being the guy who blatantly pass interfered against the Saints and kind of caused the NFL to, to change the rule on challenging pass interference. And he's kind of the, the center of it. I think after the game, he even admitted that he uh, did the pass interference. Anyway, he's a, he's a slot corner. Um, I think this we're going to get into a, a discussion about what this means for the secondary because I think it's very interesting. But what, what, what was your reaction when you saw they signed him, especially once you saw the details of the contract? Another nickel corner, you know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, by the way, by the way, I can't imagine there are very, very many players in NFL history whose names are the same as their position they play. You don't remember defensive. That. You don't remember defensive end Smith. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> joke, I joked. Uh, quarterback Jones has a chance to be really good this year. Yeah, it'll be great when we get <laughs> when we we get to cover safety Freeman. You safety know what I mean? Freeman, but it has to be spelled like S A F E T E E or something like that. Like, <laughs> it'd be great if there was like a guy named. Uh, well, you know what I was thinking about. There's a guy in the in the draft, DeAndre Swift, who's from Philly. He's running back. Could you imagine if he wasn't like Swift in his movements? Like, yeah, like he was slow, like he was Elijah Holyfield. <laughs> Right, like like guys that have like all these speed names or or names yeah, that yeah, are yeah. like descriptions of you know. I mean, <laughs> anyway, um, look, he's a he's graded out really well from Pro Football Focus for the last three years. I know he has a background with Jim Schwartz because they were together for one year in uh, Buffalo. Uh, look, this guy he's an undersized dude that uses his body well. He's a guy that is very good, surprisingly very good at defending bigger wide receivers, despite only being five foot eight and 180 pounds, really good blitzer. Look, I think this is a really positive addition. I think he's going to be the starting nickel corner. Um, my first reaction was, yeah, Vontae Maddox is moving outside. Uh, but I have a tinfoil theory, tinfoil hat theory that I wanted to kind of lay in on you. Can I, can I, since you're the host, do you mind if I if I just go off a little bit? On this? Before, before, but before we get into your theory, I, you and I were talking about this off air before the podcast. But it, it it seems like the structure of his contract has become like a common thing around the NFL. I know they changed some things in the CBA. Um, do, do you want to explain that for the listeners? Because I mean, his contract is quite low for a guy who's been a pretty good nickel cornerback in the NFL for the last few years. And I, I think I was a little surprised at like the total. I think Dan Duggan from the Athletic was like there weren't thirty one. Out of all the 31 other teams, nobody could beat this offer for a good corner. Like, what, what, What's your theory about why he signed this deal and why guys are signing deals like this? Well, and, and, and like I responded to Dan, um, <clears throat> to that tweet, you know, the Eagles were keeping a very close eye on the nickel corner Mac market for a reason. As good as this wide receiver class is, the nickel corner group is actually pretty good as well. There's a lot of hybrid players who can play safety and free safety and all that. Um, they're just, they're positionless players. And so positionless players sometimes have a tougher time finding a team unless you're the Eagles, which we'll get into later. Um, you brought up the contract like Will Parks. He had $1 million guaranteed, which was essentially the minimum contract. The minimum contract for a five-year player would be, uh, uh, $910,000. Uh, Roby's been in the league for seven years. So his is probably about a million. So, with the CBA, I don't know if you couldn't guarantee minimums, uh, minimum contracts before that, but now there seems to be this uprising of just guaranteeing minimum contracts for veterans because that way they know they have security on the roster as opposed to maybe, you know, $300,000 more, but they have a better chance of being cut. So I, I think it's a smart move for some of these corners. They're signing one-year deals to prove themselves because when you get into this upper echelon of nickel corners and, and, and outside corners, then you can kind of cash in. Uh, to me, you know, Roby Coleman was a guy that the Rams just kind of let walk because they had to. They didn't really have the money to re-sign him. Um, he's a guy that goes kind of against the norm of a lot of defensive coordinators who want bigger corners. 
nowadays. And I think that kind of hurt his market. Will Parks is another guy who the Broncos really couldn't pay. He got pretty nice offers from the Lions and the Vikings and chose to re-sign in Philly uh, or, or chose to, to return to Philly um, because he wanted to play close to home. He wanted to win championships. and He feels like the Eagles are the best opportunity to show off his versatility. You're right now, this is a buyer's market. And the only way you can combat that as a free agent is to sign with a team where you feel like your skill set will be most, you know, utilized. Yeah. Utilized. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the, you're the better word. <laughs> than me. But like, but when you look at these contracts, they're smart on both ends. For one, you get a guaranteed year essentially, or if you're cut, you get a million dollars, um, which is pretty nice. I wish they had that in journalism. <laughs> And then from the team standpoint, these are all player-friendly contracts. And we speak about player-friendly contracts. Darius Slay's contract just got brought up. And yeah. I, I, we need to talk about this because – so his his cap number this year is only $4.3 million. Next year, it'll be a little bit over $15 million, But next year is the only year on the deal that has a massive guarantee, okay? So the Eagles can get out of it after the 2021 season for a $6 million cap hit or dead money cap hit, that's pretty great. Like, that's a great team-friendly contract. And I I kind of feel like that's what they're going to do once they get to that year, honestly, just because of where he'll be. Unless he's, like, just absolutely crushing it for them. But, like, that his contract – because what are the the cap hits on the two years after that? They're pretty high, right? Um, The third year is kind of the same as the second year. (laughs) Excuse me. I'll I'll pull it up up right now. But – yeah, he's not making it to the fourth year of that deal because they can cut him and for only a dead cap charge of like three million, and I think they save like sixteen million in that thing. The last year's got a massive. Yeah, cap. yeah. So, so, so they're so twenty twenty two is nineteen point seven five cap hit, and twenty twenty three is a twenty point seven five cap hit. So, so but, but they can obviously get out of those because of like the, the bonuses or whatever. Right, but what you do is if he's playing well, you rework the deal. To yeah, where exactly. It's- yeah. You're guaranteeing him that third year, but you're bringing down his cap number, and maybe you take a little bit bigger of a cap hit in the second year. Um, he's a contract that's definitely going to be reworked. There's no question about it. He'll play on the $4.3 million cap hit this year. Obviously, he's gotten paid way more than that because it's backloaded. But I think next year you'll see them rework it to where that third year becomes guaranteed. If he's playing well. Yeah, as long as, well. as long as he's not like a disaster or whatever, yeah. Right, and I don't think he's going to be a disaster. And so here's why I don't think he's going to be a disaster. So getting into my tinfoil theory, they've brought in a bunch of guys that have nickel experience. So let's go down the list. So they have Nicole Roby Coleman. They have Will Parks. They have Avante Maddox. They have Craven LeBlanc, who they signed to an extension last year, who they like a lot. Uh, Sidney Jones has extensive experience in, in, at nickel. They signed Trevor Williams to a futures contract. He's around. Craig James also plays nickel corner. Um, so that's seven guys, right? Then on top of that, you have Rodney McLeod, who can play nickel corner. You have Jalen Mills, who can play nickel corner, who's also going to play safety. We've been told that he's going to have a hybrid role. Now, pay attention to that. That's important. Uh, there's also Marcus Epps who can probably play a little bit of nickel. That's almost, that's 10 guys that can play nickel and uh, a lot of them can play outside or what have you. Um, the name I don't bring up is Rasul Douglas and we'll get to him later. Now here's the thing. Darius Slay can move with the top receiving option of any team. Now the top receiving option of any team as you would know as an Eagles fan, isn't always a wide receiver. Sometimes he'll be matched up against a tight end. Sometimes he'll be matched up against a slot receiver. Uh, yeah. He won't always be on the outside. So Darius Slay on a week-to-week basis could be lining up somewhere different. That's why it's important to have other players around him who are who are position versatile. So, for instance, let's say he won – let's say they play the Chargers. I'm just throwing this out there. They're not playing the Chargers. I don't think they're playing the Chargers this year. I haven't looked at the schedule. Or, or let's say they're playing the Rams, okay? So he has got to line up against Robert Woods in the slot, and that's his assignment. So with that said, you need two outside corners. They brought back Jalen Mills to play safety, but what if you move Jalen Mills to be the number one, number two corner and have Avante Maddox play outside during that game? So you have those two outside corners, or Sidney Jones or what have you, then with Mills moving, you move Will Parks to strong safety. And so you feel like you, have, you haven't you have gotten worse in any 
different yeah. area. You're moving guys around. So this is the first time that Jim Schwartz has had an Eagles corner who can move around. It's different from Malcolm Jenkins to where Malcolm Jenkins had a set role and everybody had to fit in around him. Slay can bring out the best in everybody else because everybody else they have is versatile. So using Avante, let's say Slay has has to be on the out. Let's say he has to cover a tight end, okay? Then you need three corners. So you have Maddox, and you could have Maddox in the slot then, or Nicole Roby uh, Freeman in, in in the slot. Coleman, and then you can Nicole have, Roby Coleman, yeah. Oh, Coleman, sorry. I don't know why I'm yeah, stuck Freeman today. Um, <laughs> I was watching some Devontae Freeman the other day. Maybe that's what it is. Oh, um, but then you can have a guy like Mills and Sidney Jones on the outside. You have guys that have the ability to play multiple positions. I think they'll keep six corners. Um, if I had my, you know, instinctually looking at the roster right now, I think you're keeping Darius Slay, Avante Maddox as your two outside corners. If you have to label them, uh, Nick, Cole Roby Coleman as your nickel, so that's three. Um, Sydney Jones, Sydney yeah. Jones, Craven LeBlanc, and then um, your sixth guy is either going to be probably Craig James or Trevor Williams, depending on who wins that battle. As a special or, or, if they, or if they or if they draft another guy, or if they draft another guy. At this point, I'm not sure if they're going to, yeah. but they should. Um, yeah. But that guy has to be scheme versatile. So you, you look at yep. what they've done. They brought in two nickel guys, uh, and then Will Parks would obviously count as a safety. He'd be the, the probably the backup strong safety slash the third safety. So it would be Rodney McLeod, Mills, Will Parks. They'd probably draft a safety relatively early. And that would be your set of four. So you have 10 DBs there, but probably nine of them can play most positions, which I think is important. Um especially when you have a corner that can travel like Darius Slay. So that's my that's my theory on that. That said, if you can't be position versatile, you're not going to stick around. It, it's part of the reason why I'm a little concerned about Craven LeBlanc, unless they think he can play free safety, because he definitely is not an outside corner. So that's something to watch. But the guy who this really impacts is Rasul Douglas, who's already rumored to be on the trade block. We've talked about it a little bit. But they have been very clear, despite fans pleased to move him to free safety, that they only view him as an outside corner. That is a problem with this setup. He will never get on the field with this setup, if this setup is accurate. And I'm pretty comfortable saying it's accurate, just based on what I know, based on what I heard during free agency. I I reported a couple of weeks ago that they were keeping a very strong eye on the nickel cornerback uh, slash free safety market. They ended up signing Will Parks. And then they went back to the well, something I didn't see happening, and they signed Roby Coleman. Uh, Roby Coleman. So um, I think this all but uh, preludes a, a trade for Rasul Douglas. They need to find value for him. I wouldn't cut him outright. If they can't find value for him right now, I would hold on to him until the draft and try to maybe trade him for a seventh or sixth round pick if that's what it comes down to, a team maybe that loses out on, on some cornerback targets in the draft. Uh, but they have to get value for him. They can't outright cut him. He's in the fourth year of his rookie contract. He's still cheap. He's got a ton of starting experience. Um, he's in an interesting spot because there's no room for him on this roster. It's abundantly clear. What do you? What's your take on that? Yeah, I, th- I think Razul is gone. For I mean, he seems like the odd man out, and it seems like they have. I don't know if confidence is the right word, but they still want to try and get Sidney Jones to a place where he can be a player for them. Um, but one of my big takeaways from the Roby Coleman signing is it's pretty clear that uh, Jim Schwartz still kind of has a lot of sway in that building. Oh, absolutely. I, um, I, I know Jeff McLean had that story towards the end of last season about how he almost essentially is is like the the personnel guy for the defense, and um, you know there was some que- there were some questions based on the way like Doug was phrasing things about whether he'd be back this year. It doesn't seem like that was ever actually in question. And like Nicole Roby Coleman, the most he ever started in a season was seven games in Buffalo uh, in 2014. And that's when Jim Schwartz was a defensive coordinator. He's a Jim Schwartz guy. And and you were talking about all the versatility. And I mean, if if there's any defensive coordinator that wants to play like positionless defense, it's Jim Schwartz. And that's pretty much what he's building here. You know, he has Derry Slay set in one spot and Rodney McLeod set in the other. And then they could pretty much rotate all the guys that you mentioned. So, um, It, it just it just seems pretty clear to me that Jim Schwartz is still like kind of pulling a lot of strings behind the scenes there. 
Um, based on what I I heard last year, I think Hargrave was very much a Schwartz guy as well. Um, not from a background standpoint, but they were very, very aware of the the defensive tackle toll that was put on Fletcher Cox for the past two years. They needed something better. Um, and I think you bring in Hargrave, who, in my opinion, is basically Timmy Journey and on steroids. Uh, not literal. That's not a report. Don't, don't, <laughs> yeah. um, I, I know I'll show up on some fan fan blogger site that, that breaks news or whatever that's like, oh, you know, I heard that he's on. Anyway, that's been a problem on Eagle Twitter. If, comment <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but um, no, he's, I mean, Hargrave is something else, man. Like he... I, I can't praise that signing enough. Um, but yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you know, their utter lack of regard for linebacker, Jatavis Brown. I mean, like, you know, uh, that rings true. And, uh, you know, I, this is a defense that I could see them going in the draft and maybe spending two picks on. Because I don't, I don't think Schwartz particularly uh, encourages the usage of rookies. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Just the sense that I get. Um, so I, we've made a big deal of them not investing in rookies in the draft. Doesn't really seem like he's kind of inviting to that. He wants veterans. He wants guys that are proven. He wants guys that he's been able to watch in, in schemes and systems. And yeah, and if, um, if you, I mean, if you remember, Avante was only supposed to be a special teams guy as a rookie. Right. Then everybody, then everybody got hurt. Yeah, exactly. And he had to fill in for Corey Graham. He had to fill in for Roddy McLeod. Um, and he did a pretty good job. I think uh, I think Maddox Maddox struggled last year in the slot, and I think they noticed that, and then went back and watched the tape of him in 2018 when he was on the outside, where he actually played better. He's a smaller corner, but you want like he, he's not ideal for a number one corner, but if you have him as a number two corner, especially uh, against the Z spot, uh, which is typically the speed guy, I think Maddox can do pretty well there. I mean, he's not the fastest guy in the world, but I think he does a very good job of, of keeping even. Um, and so when you have the number one guy taken care of by Darius Slay, I think Maddox versus the number two guy is a smart move. I, I just don't think he's, I don't think he's shifty enough and I don't think his hips are loose enough for him to just be able to shut down that nickel corner spot. And I think Ro- Roby Coleman's a guy who's shown that he can play very, very well there. All right, let's flip to the other side of the ball where the Eagles haven't added a single player on offense, which is a little surprising, at least. I think we can both agree on that. Um, yeah. I guess, what's your theory about why? I mean, it seems like pretty obvious they're just going for the draft, but what's your theory on why they haven't even really like pursued receivers at all, it seems like? By the way, we should say Brashad Perryman, Robbie Anderson, and your guy Tajay Sharp all signed with new teams. Um, I think that's all the major ones that signed elsewhere. But yeah. so, the wide, so the wide receiver market, if there was one, is dwindling quite a bit. Yeah, there was like a 48-hour period where like literally every wide receiver signed for a minimum deal. <laughs> it was very yeah. interesting. Um, look, I, I've said before on the podcast, I wasn't big in on Robbie Anderson signing for more than $8 million. Uh, they clearly weren't either. Um, the more I had heard about their budget for wide receiver, the more it sounded like Rashad Perryman probably wasn't going to be an option. He ended up getting six million guaranteed with eight, with the possibility of eight due to incentives um, with the Jets. But other than that, everybody's really signed for minimum deals or a little bit over the minimum, which tells you that the Eagles are really just like focused in on the draft, which I get. But like you're putting yourself in a position to where you're definitely going to dra- double dip in probably the first four rounds at the position and then you're going to rely on a rookie the way you had to rely on JJ or single white side last year. And it didn't work out. Um, now there are guys in this draft that are significantly talent, more talented than JJ and probably significantly more NFL ready, but that still puts you in a weird spot, especially when the rest of the league knows exactly what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody's telegraphed a, a, a position <laughs> out that's picked in the top 20 like this before that yeah. I can remember. Yeah, I mean, because if you think about it, the Eagles don't draft linebackers or safeties in the first round ever, and they haven't signed any wide receivers. So, like, everybody and their mother knows what the Eagles are going to do in the draft right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, before they signed Hargrave, I thought uh, Kinlaw made a ton of sense for them. Um, The defensive ends towards the back end of this draft, I'm not sure I really 
think they're that good. I also think they appreciate their defensive ends way more than the fan base or the writers do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, unless they surprise you with a offensive tackle, which I don't think will be there, because um, I yeah. think there's going to be a run on offensive tackle. I mean, like, unless there's like a center they really liked or something, I guess. Right. Like, can you imagine uh, if they, can you imagine in a year where they need wide receivers? If he goes drafted a center, that'd be that's like a classic Andy Reid move back in the yeah, day. Yeah, that would be something, wouldn't it? Um, like drafting Danny Watkins instead of <laughs> anybody else. You know, I think um, you, you go back to last year's draft, they were not expecting Andre Dillard to fall. I'm sure they no. were trying to get Hollywood Brown. And yeah. so then they wouldn't be in this position this year, but they would be looking for a left tackle. Yeah, the, the Ravens GM said when he saw the Eagles uh, traded up, he thought they were going to draft Hollywood Brown, and he was freaking out about it, and then they picked Dillard. So, Right, so like that's something that needs to be considered too. I haven't really seen that talked about. The fact is is that you know there's a butterfly effect here. Is They traded up, and they got Andre Dillard, and so they had to – they really wanted Miles Sanders, so they had to resort to losing out on uh, McCole Hardman and, you know – drafting JJ instead I think there's there's a significant narrative there because now they're in this position where they kind of have a gun to their head they they need to draft a guy uh and I just put out a a two-round mock draft for the full NFL which you can check on nj.com um I had the Eagles double dipping um I had them trading two of their three fourth round picks the 21st overall pick and a 2021 second round pick to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for the 14th overall pick and drafting Henry Ruggs after uh, the Raiders took C.D. Lamb and the 49ers selected uh, Jerry Judy. And I think that's realistically what they're going to have to do. They might even have to trade up earlier than that, considering that the Jets may view George Fawn as their starting left tackle. Gross. Uh, <laughs> would tell you a lot about uh, Joe Douglas's ability to evaluate talent, not that the last three years haven't. Um, uh, you know, the Jaguars could be open to a wide receiver at nine as well. I know they have DJ Chark, but, you know, maybe maybe that's an option there too. So they're in a spot where, like, they almost have to invest picks or they're going to have to settle for the second tier of wide receivers, which is still very good. You're looking at Denzel Mims, you're looking at, Justin Jefferson, who I'm a big fan of. You're, you're looking at Jalen Rager and Brandon Ayuk. And I, I just think there's a massive drop off there. And if you're going to invest in every position but wide receiver, it does feel like you have to kind of hit a home run there. Well, yeah. I mean, especially, and you alluded to this, they're basically going to be relying on this guy to be their number two receiver next year. <laughs> like, like at worst. worst. At worst. Yeah. And, and, and you're doing that from a – for an office that hasn't really have done a great job in draft evaluations of the wide receiver position over the years. So, I mean, they're, they're not going in the draft thinking, okay, we're going to mess this up, but like on the outside looking in, like why would you be confident that they're going to get the right guy if they don't go up and get Henry Ruggs? Like, right. I mean, it's a concern. And the thing is, is a lot of people want to put Henry Ruggs in a box and say that, you know, he's this speed guy uh, but he's also got great hands. He runs really good routes. Like he's a complete wide receiver. Like this is a dude. I this honestly guy, wouldn't be surprised if he was the first receiver picked. It, it wouldn't shock me. No, yeah. especially if the Jaguars were interested in wide receiver, he would be the guy that would make a lot of sense for them just based yeah. on philosophy. But, um, you know, I think, um, I think what's cool about what they're doing is they've, what I will give them credit for is they've clearly realized the defense was an issue, like from a personnel standpoint, like Uh it it wasn't Jim Schwartz. Like as much as people get upset about Jim Schwartz, he also had to rely on talent that was not very good, especially in that back end. And I think, um, you know, losing Malcolm is going to be killer that first year, but when you have Slay at a position that's actually more valuable moving around and you're able to have a weekly game plan, uh, where you can deploy pretty much anyone anywhere, it makes it difficult for opposing offenses to game plan, and I think that that's really smart. The issue I have is when you let guys like Tajay Sharp sign from league minimum deals uh, elsewhere, you're really like not helping your depth cause. Like, where's the competition? This is a team that prides itself on competition, and right now, uh, look, everybody fell in love with Greg Ward. I think Greg Ward's terrific. 
I also think he's a fourth or fifth wide receiver. So if you're depending on him to be your starting slot receiver, I, I just kind of think like you need to take a step back and realize like, hey, this was about getting better. Uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um. All right. Before we go, one last topic because I know you got to get going a little bit. But uh, so why do you think the Eagles also haven't done anything with Alshon Jeffrey? He's a name we haven't brought up at all. So what I'll say is this: I think they don't want to outright cut him, and I yeah. I get that. I get that. That's like a hardcore admittance of loss. They're paying the guy anyway. It doesn't really make a ton of sense. That said. Right now, I don't know how you implement him in the offense, especially with the coronavirus kind of making it difficult to evaluate injuries and have guys around the facility and do all this stuff. But that also impacts your ability to trade him as well, because it's not like he's, you know, let's say the Jets wanted him. It's not like he's going up the turnpike and just, you know, able to go to their facility and take all these tests. It's just not doable. So that's going to expand his window of, of trade eligibility. Um, I think, you know, it's smart. You know, you see the Jaguars holding on to Yannick Ngakwe. I think it's smart to kind of build your momentum and build your leverage going into a draft because, you know, there are going to be teams that miss out on defensive ends. There's going to be teams that miss out on wide receivers. There's going to be teams that have to settle for a speed guy when they kind of wanted a big guy. Um, and so maybe that's when you think, you know, maybe we can ship, Jeffrey offer a seventh round pick, you know, in that seventh round teams get kind of weird about those seventh round picks. You know, you saw with the Son Ridgeway, they were, the Eagles were able to trade a seventh round pick that they got from the Patriots like two hours earlier and, and get a guy who was a reasonable contributor who was still young, who was still on a rookie contract. I think that was a great trade. So, you know, maybe teams want to wait for that. Maybe Howie who has experience with trading premium players during training camp when there's an injury, maybe they want to hold on to Jeffrey till he gets healthy. And then if there's an injury in camp, you trade him before week one to a team that needs wide receiver help. Uh, you know, to me, if, if they don't feel like there's a problem internally, like genuinely, then I understand wanting to keep him, I guess, because you're paying him anyway. If there's a problem internally, this is a really big issue and you need to get rid of him. Um, I mean, and, but, and, and and you look at the fact that the big storyline this offseason is they want Carson Wentz to be in control of the locker room, and even the perception is that Alshon Jeffrey is a deterrent to that. So, yeah, exactly. And I think too, you know, the narratives coming out, which are clearly narratives from the team, uh, that they want young guys to kind of develop, or they wanted Malcolm Jenkins gone so they could give the locker room to Carson. Those are big issues, like. Yeah. Carson should be able to take the locker room anyway. He's the quarterback. But yeah. my point is, is like, I said l- several times last offseason that last offseason was about making Carson Wentz comfortable. That clearly did not happen. I mean, he was better. Like, he got them – he won them a division. Like, he stayed healthy. This year really needs to be about making Carson the guy, the centerpiece of everything. Every, every they, they should eat, sleep, and drink Carson Wentz's – you know, messaging his ability, et cetera. You should be setting him up to succeed. And right now, what have they done on offense to set him up to succeed? They brought back Nate Sudfeld, who I guess is like the new Jim Sorgi for him. But like, <laughs> I just, that's where the disconnect is. Um, they struggled last year with with route running at the wide receiver position and timing. Uh, and those that was mostly the young guys. Uh so to bring in someone, bring in two probably rookies that are going to play premium roles, like I, it's just a weird strategy to have. I, I get that they have budgetary issues. I get that they need to probably roll over a lot of cap because next year you're going to have a dead hit of $10 million or $16 million for Jeffrey, regardless of whether you cut him this year or not. And, um, you know, they've made their bets. They have to lie in it. And they've invested a lot of money in the wide receiver position between Deshaun and Alshon. Uh, but again, like, what do you, how have you gotten better? You know what I mean? mean? I mean, they literally haven't added a single player on offense, which like, if you're trying to build around your quarterback, like I know they love the young guys, they love Sanders, they love the tight ends, 
I mean, you even pointed out on Twitter, like they don't have a swing tackle. I maybe they'll draft one in the middle rounds. That's kind of what I feel like they'll do. But well, I think that's like a big like undercurrent of all this, right? So you're making you're trying to make Carson Wentz feel comfortable. Andre Dillard started like three games at left tackle. Uh, this is his first year, and that's fine. Uh, but you need to have an insurance policy there. Everybody wants to talk about how Big V did never play. You know, he was a rookie and he was developing behind you know, the, the other tackles, but the the difference is you had two all pros. Now you only have one all pro. You can't lean on Jason Peters at left tackle. What if Andre Dillard has a terrible five game streak? Yeah. You can't, I mean, you can't just be like, Oh cool. We'll put some other guy who's never been in there before. You talk about Jordan Maylotta. Jordan Maylotta has never played <laughs> more than two quarters of an important, not even an important of an exhibition of, game of, an, of any of a collegiate game of a high school game. He hasn't played I mean, that, like, a snap. <laughs> I mean, look, I get it. The Eagles dreamed a dream of of Jordan Melata being that guy, but like, you know, it, it's it, I, I don't know how you he didn't practice at all last year. He was on IR yeah. all last year. Yeah, uh, maybe they like Matt Pryor at that position, but Matt Pryor's never really practiced consistently at left tackle throughout his career because Andre Dillard had that role last year and Big V had the year before. So, um, I'm a little concern there yeah like maybe you draft a guy in the third or fourth round but a lot of people are very confident in in Jordan Melata and Matt Pryor and I think Matt Pryor is better off serving in the role that Big V had last year where he backed up the right guard and right tackle positions because those are his natural positions I mean yeah he could probably play left guard but I mean you've you've got guys like um, Nate Herbig who they seemingly like who could back up center and left guard similarly to the way uh, you know, they've kind of used Isaac Samalo in the past. That left back up left tackle spot is very, very important. They, this is a team that built around the trenches and to not have experience or at least talent behind that position is very, very uh, concerning. Yeah. And I should say that it looks like they have a, so they didn't factor in like five of the new players, but since they're all low, I, th- I think they probably have around 20 million still in cash yeah. space. Which, uh, if you look at like the contracts that have been handed out to the non like top of the market guys, like you can you can get a handful of players with that. So, I, I'm I'm guessing how he's not completely done yet, but I it is it is crazy that there hasn't been a single offensive player added. That's what I'll say. Yeah, I think it's it's bizarre a little yeah. bit. All right, well, well we'll let you go. You got a you got a conference call to get to. Um, we'll wrap up on that note. Uh. If the Eagles make any other big moves, we'll get another pod your way. Uh, as always, leave some comments and write some reviews. Uh, we'll get we'll get to them when we get the chance on our next pod. We haven't really been able to yet, but uh, yeah, thanks for listening, guys, and sign up for Eagles Extra. Goodbye.